morning, everybody. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this conference hosted by Kerr Talk on such an important topic, one that's incredibly important to me and to all of us who have joined this session this morning, to explore equality of health and care services with and for people with learning disabilities and or autism. My name is Ashling Duffy. The evidence is stark. People with learning disabilities and or autism have poorer health than their non-disabled peers, and these differences are largely avoidable and as such represent health inequalities. We also know the impact of these inequalities is serious. Sadly, there is no shortage of evidence and COVID-19 has further exacerbated the inequalities people with learning disabilities and or autism face. Recently, Healthwatch England have released new figures showing two thirds of NHS trusts are not giving people with additional communication needs equal access to care. So tackling inequalities requires system-wide change alongside a person-centered approach to understanding the health and care needs of people with learning disabilities and autism. It requires us to focus on and stand up for people's human rights to get the right care and support at the right time. Today, we want to focus on action, the things that we can do in this virtual room to make a difference. We know there are lots of people doing brilliant work to make a real difference in this area. And I am delighted to say we're going to be hearing from a number of them this morning. Good health is about having all the opportunities to live a good life. And today we're going to hear from a range of speakers sharing some of their experiences and learning to help and inspire us. We also would love to hear from you. Questions and comments can be posted throughout the morning and we have time set aside after each set of speakers for questions. As well as encouraging to, uh, you to ask some questions, I would also like each of us to decide on one action we're going to take away to do as a direct result of today's discussions. So please do have a think what that action will be for you. So if we can now have a look at the agenda, please, Natalie, that would be wonderful. So here's our agenda. Um, as promised, a really exciting number of speakers, uh, uh, starting with communication counts and equality of access to health services, aging matters in learning disability services and advising the advisors. There will then, after those three presentations, be an opportunity for us to hear some of your questions to the panel. Then after that Q&A, we then move into a further three sessions, starting with relationships and learning disability services, the right to living a good life, and innovations in social care. Um, at the end, of course, there'll be a final session, a uh, final opportunity to, to hear your questions and to um, put those to our panelists before we wrap up at one o'clock. So um, without any further delay from me, I know you will be keen to hear from our speakers. Um, well, in fact, I think there's one little bit of promotion we want to do just before we introduce our first uh, speakers. And um, yeah, here it is. We want to really encourage you to get nominating for the National Learning Disability Awards. Fabulous ceremony happening in July, 8th of July in 2022. You want to be there? get nominating all that fabulous work that's happening across the country in uh, uh, supporting people learning disabilities and autism. So good stuff. We're now going to move to our first speaker. Um, so this session is Communication Counts and Equality of Access to Health Services. Um, and I have just had a message to say that unfortunately Lloyd isn't going to be able to make it. Um, if we can get Lloyd in, we will, of course. But for now, I'm delighted to introduce Jim Blair. 
Jim is an independent consultant, nurse in learning disabilities, an associate professor of intellectual disabilities at Kingston University and St. George's University of London, a clinical advisor to NHS England for care treatment reviews, panel member of the Nursing and Midwifery Council's Fitness to Practice panel and chair of the Royal College of Nursing London Board. Jim is also a patron of Down Syndrome, which I think sounds the most fascinating part of your brief so far, Jim, and is on the editorial board of Intellectual Disability and Health. It is my pleasure to welcome Jim Blair. Over to you, Jim. Can you not hear anything, Lloyd? No, I'm, I'm, hang on now. I'm just going to try and log in again, Jim. All right. OK. Hang on. OK. I think you can hear live Lloyd trying to join our session. Jim, yeah. can I pass over to you, please? Yes, hi. Good Good morning, everybody. Um, and I was going to try and get Lloyd in just so he's on the phone, but I've been having a lot of problems with, with the technical uh, stuff so far today. But um, nice to see you all. So what we're going to talk about, well, it looks like what I'm going to talk about is um, learning disability nursing and how we get things right for people and how um, things can improve going forward. I don't know if there's a, the slides that I sent through. There was a slide I sent through. If that can be put on the screen, that'd be helpful. So. Thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, the topic leveling up, um, I'm actually not really sure what that means, quite frankly. Um, not just for people with a learning disability um, or the, the, this sort of mix of learning disability with autism. Learning disability and autism are very, very different things. They're not the same uh, and people's needs are significantly different, although there are some similarities. So leveling up for me does also need to be that the, we need to be distinct clarity about who is being supported, what issues they face, what challenges they face, and a much more inclusive uh, legislation and legislative process than we currently have at the moment where some things seem to be um, increasing inequalities than um, reducing them and that I'm referring to some of the recent policy developments and other things like that. That might seem controversial, I'm not against people having um, things that are directed towards their needs, far from it, but I think it should be broader and should be opened up to many more and we need to strengthen what we've already got. So I'm going to just talk because Lloyd can't get through and he can't hear you on the phone either. Um, so Lloyd is a 62 year old man with a learning disability. I've known Lloyd for about 26 years and he's worked at Mencap for about uh, 30 years now. Uh, his biggest problem in life is the fact he supports Chelsea, but I can't change that for him. I'm a West Ham fan, so I'm very excited about the quarter final that's taking place later on today um, and I shall be there. But back to our talk, the five key things that this is what learning disability nurses uh, need to do, but in fact, it's what everybody needs to do in reality. Um, but the skill sets are specific in terms of learning disability nurses and how to get things right for people with a learning disability and how we can change that. I'm also going to talk a bit about a balance of power shift that really does need to change if we're going to get this, whatever the levelling up quite means, um, if we're going to get the change in care delivery design and evolution that we require, that will need to happen. So within the talk, that will come in as well. So the first thing is addressing uh, diagnostic overshadowing. Diagnostic overshadowing is a significant hidden killer for people with a learning disability and does lead to their deaths. Uh, frequently, uh, those avoidable deaths uh, that take place actually happening because people haven't done what they should have done before um, the person has got to the stage where their life is, is coming to an end. And by that I mean, um, I'm a 54 year old man who doesn't have a learning disability. So I'm gonna smack my head against the wall now. You don't think that's uh, what white guys who are 54 um, and don't have a learning disability do, but throw the learning disability in there. And that's what people often get blinded by, the learning disability. And that is what diagnostic overshadowing is. It is putting things down to someone's disability condition, whatever their situation is, their health condition, and not seeing beyond that, because even salt looks like sugar. All that you see isn't all that there is. We need to be much clearer about what it is that somebody is experiencing and behind every behavior change, be it a new one or an increase of an old one, it is looking for a physical uh, health reason uh, as you would for anybody else, but frequently that doesn't happen for people with a learning disability. Addressing the uh, 
health issues of people with learning disabilities and, and how they relate to people with learning disabilities. That's including tuning into people's frequency in relation to how they experience pain, for example, because somebody might be having uh, what seems to be a laugh, but actually it could be that they're in pain. And it's the slight changes in the pitch and tone and sound and gestures that the person is making that demonstrates that they're in pain and not um, actually just having a laugh. And the central one, the one that is the most important for this talk, is around consistently engaging individuals and their families in care evolution. And that's where I'm going to bring in the levelling up in relation to uh, the balance of power shift that I was talking about just a few seconds ago. So I'm going to leave that one for now, but I will come back to it. And the education in action. This is about replicating and modelling how to work with people with the learning disability in relation to their health and care outcomes. And that's what learning disability nurses are particularly good at doing across uh, hospital settings, be they acute, be they mental health settings, be they assessment treatment units, be they community services, social care settings, education settings, wherever we are, these are the things that we can help build with and for people with the learning disabilities, their families and others that support them and shape and guide how things can be evolved and developed. And the fifth and, uh, and final but significant element is an acute understanding of the Mental Capacity Act, the Equality Act and Human Rights Act, as Ailing quite rightly pointed out. It is vital that we understand that equal treatment does not mean treatment should be the same. And by that, I'm talking about, if you like, a ladder to uh, enable people to access the, tr the care and treatment that they need, that ladder, if you like, in each rung is a reasonable adjustment along that way. So it might be extending visiting times, might be reducing the visual noise by lighting reduction or light increasing, depending on someone's eyesight requirements and other things. And also ensuring that um, people have things in a tailored way for them. So when you think about communication, we're thinking about pictures, signs and symbols. Nobody feels patronised driving down the road, looking at road signs without loads and loads of words. But yet we waste an awful lot of money producing things in loads and loads of words, in loads of different languages and loads of different formats, when really what we should be looking at is putting it in signs and symbols that people could understand whoever they are, whatever their background, whatever their situation in terms of language function or non-language function. And let me be reminded by this as well. The issue in relation to when you go on a plane, the safety card has no words, yet you know how to keep yourself safe on a plane if it crashes, uh, hopefully that would be the case. And you know when you go to an airport that the plane going up like that means that's the departures and the one going down is arrivals. So we use an awful lot in visual worlds. And in learning disabilities, the brilliant books beyond words which Lloyd is, has been author of two books of theirs, um, are absolutely essential and a vital tool for helping people to get things right. So in communicating, it is about putting things in ways that everybody can understand, whoever they are, what their situation is. Now, in the last few minutes that I've got of this talk, um, and unfortunately Lloyd still is not able to join us, but one of the things that he's really passionate about and I'm passionate about, and I've done some work with uh, Scott Watkin, who was, um, and this was a brilliant initiative, well done by Department of Health all those years ago, having him as a co-national director, as somebody with a learning disability. Wonderful. Should never have stopped that. That was a big mistake. And levelling up, if, that, if there is such a thing, that is the sort of thing that we need to bring back. So we need to have three co-national directors. One, person with a learning disability. The second, a parent. And a third, a professional. To shift the balance of power. So... The people with living experience, be it parental or living by having a learning disability, are the two out of the three. That already changes the balance of power that currently exists. Then we should have a panel that holds this group to hold these directors and others to account, made up of 53% people with a learning disability, 14%, sorry, 31% people, uh, parents and others, and then the final 14% being made up of uh, professionals. And then if you look at that, if you take it out of 10, it would be an 80-20 split. So 80 would be people with living and lived experience and 20 would be professionals. In my mind, that's the correct way of going forward. They would be then involved in developing and delivering and be accountable for the education, delivery, evaluation, quality monitoring and improvements. 
Why is that so important? Because these are the people that live this. I don't live this. I've been a learning disability nurse for about 28 years. I don't have a learning disability. My daughter doesn't have a learning disability. So I do have some knowledge, but not the wealth of lived knowledge. And that's what we really need to do. So if we're serious about leveling up, if we're serious about um, communicating more effectively and efficiently, we need to involve people in continually engaging them in the care evolution, be it social, education and health that we wish to see. Then we will see real change. Then we will see how people's needs are delivered in a focused, individual, tailored way. And this can be, this model could be used for people with autism, people with diabetes, people with epilepsy, that model of the balance of power shift. It needs to happen. It must become policy and then change will happen. And I believe then we will get whatever leveling up means. If that means leveling up so everyone then gets better access to things, if that's what we're understanding by leveling up, then that will certainly be achieved. Thank you very much for listening. Jim, brilliant, thank you so much. And um, I really like that you've really described the kind of future vision for that balance shift in the balance of power, which for me is absolutely critical. And I'd be really keen to get into a bit of a conversation. We come on to the Q&A about what we can all do to help put things in that direction. I also love the, uh, 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 the comparison with the, the signs and symbols that we use on our everyday lives and flights and roads. And you know, I think it's really important way of kind of important way of getting that across to people. So thank you so much. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello, We're Lloyd here. Hello, Lloyd. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, so I'm very, very sorry I'm late. Lloyd, I'm, I, I think the problem was technology. I don't think it was any other issue. Um, oh. Jim has just oh, done God. a what, what? I don't, I tell you, I tell you, I don't know what went wrong. I, I was still trying logging in today, but I'm so, oh, blinking it. Well, listen, Lloyd, um, I like your assessment of the situation. Blinking heck sounds the perfect. You could have been ruder, but I'm grateful that you were. So That's a perfect you. word for it, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful stuff. Lloyd, Jim has just finished giving us a wonderful presentation. And um, we now, on the timing, need to move on to our next presenter. So, but there will be an opportunity for some questions a little later this morning. So hopefully you will be able to stay with us for that and contribute to it then. Does that sound okay? Yes, of course, yes. Wonderful. So if you want to go on mute for now, uh, Lloyd and, and Jim, that would be wonderful. Um, and we are now, I'm now delighted to welcome our next speaker, which is Nicola Payne, uh, who's the best practice manager for McIntyre, a national charity providing support for children, young people and adults who live with a learning disability and or autism for the past 17 years. Nicola is part of the organization's health team and is currently leading on a national lottery funded pilot project called Dying to Talk, which empowers people to have choice and control in planning for their future and to support staff teams and families to be able to start these important conversations. Nicola has spent many years working alongside people living with a learning disability and a diagnosis of dementia. She is, passionate, is a passionate advocate who supports everyone to have a voice and works in ways that make sense to everyone. Nicola, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've got a 15 minute window to share with you our approach at McIntyre. So I'm gonna do a lot of next slides. So could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so what we're gonna cover over the next 15 minutes is, um, we are going to be uh, a brief introduction to who McIntyre are, supporting people to live well, how we, how we do that and our approach at McIntyre. Uh, I'm gonna introduce to you the Dying to Talk project, which really uh, allow, encompasses choice and control and just our organizational approach and, and the support that we, we empower people that live with a learning disability uh, to have. So, um, the McIntyre, so if you haven't heard of us, we're a national tra a charity that we support children, young people and adults uh, with a learning disability or a diagnosis of autism. 
And we are dotted around uh, England and Wales. So we're quite a big organisation, uh, but we have many different uh, people that we support. I should have said next slide, so apologies. <laughs> so could we move on to, and, and again, thank you. And I wanted to start with this picture because it's wonderful. It, they're very current and up-to-date photos of people that we support here at McIntyre. I know, I know all of them uh, and it's just, brings to life the people that I get to work with on a mo you know on down throughout the daily on a daily basis but we want to you know th this is a very happy picture but behind these pictures there's this human beings and they all have their own individual needs they all they all face health inequalities and we want to change that uh, and people with uh, live with a learning disability um, as we know and we hear daily and I know I do how do we support that and break those barriers down and we need to recognize this and support and challenge it where we can so I just want you to sort of hold on to this picture so if you're having a bad day take a look at it and think you know this is this is just a happy happy picture so next slide please so a leader I should imagine most people on this uh, on this conference this morning have heard of leader but at McIntyre we, we contribute to leader and we do this as we want to see improvements with health inequalities for people with a learning disability. Leader looks at uh, ways people are dying why people are dying much younger than the general population and leader finds out why people have died and what needs to be changed and uh, as an organization if we know that we can really focus on uh, alleviating that for people and allowing and empowering people to live better lives and healthier lives. Um, yeah so next slide please. So what we're currently doing at McIntyre is we're car carrying out an annual health check project, which allows us to really de delve into what annual health checks look like. The staff really know why these are carried out when a health action plan is, is in place. Are we, are we supporting a person to sort of achieve what's being suggested or, or advised by a GP or a health professional? So we're going to start by visiting homes across our organisation, going in, supporting those staff teams, picking out trends and collecting all this rich data, which will over a chunk of a period of time will give us a real rich pathway forwards, really, of our, of our focus within the health team. Uh, and that that fills me with confidence that we know then we're really working on things that are important within a person um, and, and helping them to achieve those those goals set by a, a GP. And having a clear and supportive system in place for McIntyre will help people find out why and if they have any health problems that could go unmissed or they, they, they've they been captured within a health check. Uh, and, and that's that sort of sits stagnant for a year or so till the next health check. So we think by doing this, uh, and, and we know by doing this project, it's really going to give us a bright light moving forwards on, on our approach. And just, to, yeah, that whole, you know, making sure that person's getting the right care and support that they, they, they deserve, that they, they absolutely deserve. The next slide, please. So uh, touching upon growing older and dementia, we do support a lot of people at McIntyre living with a diagnosis of dementia, young, uh, as we as uh, um, it's commonly known now that a lot of people living with Down syndrome, it's much earlier detected or diagnosed. Uh, we've worked closely at McIntyre to really empower staff teams to recognize this. Uh, and we've got quite a strong structure in place now. So when there's a suspicion of dementia, or a, a newly diagnosed person, we, 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 we've got that real rich pathway of support that we can, we can uh, support our staff teams and absolutely families as well, because this is a daunting time. So uh, I'll just put some figures on there for you to see. I won't go through them all, but that, you know, how that looks within, you know, with a person living with, uh, a, with Down syndrome. The next slide, please. And dementia can be difficult to diagnose for anybody, but absolutely much more difficult uh, with a person living with, um, with a learning disability. And just coming up on the screen now are some barriers that we face and we need to overcome. So uh, I'll just let those pop up so you can see them. Absolutely, depending on where we live, Jim mentioned diagnostic overshadowing. We see that so commonly at McIntyre and it's around empowering uh, the, the team to feel more confident to sort of challenge what they hear. Uh, misdiagnosis, not being diagnosed as well. A lack of awareness. We spend a lot of time at McIntyre upskilling staff to 
you know, people are getting older, you're going to start to see changes, that's inevitable, but it could be dementia, it could just be get growing older, but let's feel more equipped and uh, as, a, as a service or a home that you work in. So next slide, please. So at McIntyre, there was a, a couple of years ago, we, we worked closely to think about how we could support people living with a learning disability or a diagnosis of autism to capture their health changes. So we uh, wanted to equip our staff teams to feel confident in this because we knew that there was a limited um, reporting happening. So we um, were really lucky to work alongside um, the uh, NHS with the health calendar, the anticipatory health calendar. And we invested time to really upskill our staff teams around this. So they felt skilled. And if any of you have come across the health calendar or use it, I hope you agree it's a really, really brilliant tool that records daily changes of a person. And by doing this, we then have this really rich data that we can present to, to a health professional to say, something actually isn't right. This isn't anything to do with their learning disability. Um, and, and we've got that rich evidence that uh, usually opens up that next pathway or door of support. And I think the next slide is just a, the same sort of a picture of the calendar of what we use. So if we go on to the next one as well, uh, that would be brilliant. So we, a baseline health assessment, the calendar only works with a really rich baseline of what's normal for me today, and that stays with me. So when I do start to present differently or changes happening when I'm getting older, you've got what, what I was once like to sort of have that real, uh, uh, again, I use the word evidence a lot to say to, to, to a health professional that, you know, this isn't just growing older, there's a real need here that this person that I'm supporting needs that um that, that that same uh, pathway of support in a, in a health way that I would have uh, just because I haven't got a learning disability. So next slide, we have um, just what we see, how it's improving health, health outcomes for people supported. It's quite small, I apologise, but it improves so many things and I won't read them all, but communication, it aids early detection, it helps improve assessments pathways. So it really is a good um, and we recommend it highly, but if you've got any questions around that, do, do get in touch with me after because, uh, yeah, I'm a massive advocate of it, advocate of it at McIntyre. So, okay. So, and again, just um, how it's helping. Next slide, just some um, that I wanted to share with you, how it's helping people to live uh, safer and better lives. So if you just pop the little coloured squares up, that would be wonderful. So I stopped talking just for a second. and. Okay, you will get these slides after as well, just so you are whizzing through. Okay, so we're going to move on a little bit now, and I'm just going to bring to life as much as I can our Dying to Talk project. So uh, on the next slide, we have um, a little bit of information around that, and the Dying to Talk project really got set up because we realized we needed to start having those conversations because we see that people are are living longer uh, living with a learning disability which is absolutely wonderful but we need to start having those conversations about what would you like for your future uh, choice and control making those decisions you know that we would make um, and and feeling empowered about that so we have a real luxury at McIntyre at the moment that we can do that and invest a whole you know we've got a whole team it's not just me around uh, rolling that out so we're delivering workshops we're providing information and resort and creating resources and we're finding the best ways of how we can actually do this in a meaningful way and this is a this is a, a workshop on its own for me to share with you but if you do go to the next slides we have aims of our project as well um, it is a national lottery funded project so we do have to provide aims but really in a nutshell it's about feeling less frightened normalizing the conversation uh, empowering with choice, involving families, working closely with health professionals um, and um, de developing a legacy of resources really. So if we do move on to the next um, slide and that would be wonderful. And if we move on, staff shared with us why, um, uh, uh, you know, when they're supporting people to get older that they, uh, 
Sorry, I've lost my way there. Sorry, let me start that again. So staff also shared with us, death and dying was very difficult, which probably doesn't come as a shock uh, to have those conversations. So we've really invested time to speak and train staff to feel more in control. Uh, so, you know, we can go into services and provide that support in homes, but our staff teams need to feel confident in doing that. So we have much more information on our website around the Dying to Talk project, but I'm just going to move on now to how to think about how we can support a person to have a good death. And we, we, we use that confidently, you know, it is possible to have a good death if there's a, a choice and control where possible within that. And I've just popped onto this slide, just a few things to think about. And these are no different at all for a person living with a learning disability. And this is what we want to start to think about how we can do this for people that can contribute with words, but also how we need to be more creative on supporting people that are more profoundly uh, disabled as well. And we're doing that well at McIntyre, but absolutely no difference at all. So moving on and thinking about how we can think about a good death, and we're hearing this a lot more across, echoing across McIntyre now around, you know, I've supported someone to have a good death, which is, it, it's, it's quite moving when I hear that, but it's all around communication, teamwork, having those conversations where possible and planning ahead, involvement of the person, not fearing that. Uh, don't fear the subject. Again, if you feel more upskilled uh, and confident, that's going to bounce into the home that maybe you work in and it could be a relief it could be a relief that you're starting these conversations with people with a learning disability because it's something that can be and still is a bit of a taboo subject and if we move on we've just got a few uh, images here what what is meant by a good death and again you'll probably um, relate to a lot of these no difference at all, no difference at all for you and I to the to people that I support here at McIntyre. We want these things and we want to know what these things are. What does calm feel like for you? What are your wishes? Let's grab those memories, let's create life story. Let's feel safe, secure and, and absolutely pain-free. Um, you know, so all of these things we under the dying to talk umbrella, but also at McIntyre, it's just feeling confident that we're, we're enabling people to know that this is OK to share with us and not forgetting family contribution. And if we move on it, just here, I've just popped, but, um, you know, by not being told or involved can stop the person having very important last times and contributions and sharing. And we are, we still hear, you know, or oh, we don't want our daughter to be involved in this because it's going to cause too much upset. That's, you know, we respect that. But then we, we, when a conversation takes place with a family member, normally that when they see our approach and why we're encouraging this, usually that barrier comes down. But it's that kind of scaredness that we want to just go, you know, it's OK, we can do this well and we can do this in a supportive way. And moving on, always encompassing dignity. So, our, you know, we're uh, the champions of the, the dignity do's at, at McIntyre. They're here. Again, it's just thinking about, are we doing that? Are we encompassing all of these things and allowing a person to have choice, control, dignity? Um, so I won't go through those in because I am aware of a little bit of time. But also, if we move on to the next slide, just popping this up, we use this at McIntyre, the one chance to get it right. It's a tool that really... It's, it's set out in easy, digestible chunks to make sure that I'm getting everything right. I'm not missing out anything because it can be very uh, overwhelming at the time when you are supporting someone to have but that, that is at end of life care. So this is a national document. It's not ours. It's a, available uh, for everyone to take a look at. So just in case you uh, are thinking what you could use within your organisation and moving on to the ambitions for palliative care and end of life. And uh, this is the most recent one that we are uh, using at McIntyre, uh, as well as our own in-house policies as well, which um, which we're confident in. So it's just great, isn't it, how it's all just broken down into those digestible uh, pathways. Okay, coming just uh, to the next slide. This is Martin. Martin was supported at McIntyre for many years. He had a learning disability, as you can see, and a, a diagnosis of Down syndrome, but also dementia. We spent and invested a lot of time with Martin, Martin's family and his team of, of how we could help and support Martin to have a good death. You, I've popped the link on there to Martin's case study. It's quite an, a detailed case study that there might be learning from there that you could uh, take a look at so do feel free to uh, to, to pop onto that and uh, download it and, and 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 have some time to look at that 
And just moving on slightly, I know I've, I've probably got about a minute or so to go, advanced care plans. Absolutely, we need to start thinking about planning for the future. I've said that. Everybody is entitled to have an advanced care plan. If we move on to the next slide, we do have our own McIntyre ad, ad, ad examples of this. You might have your own. It doesn't matter what you use, but it's about capturing that and capturing it in a way that makes sense for that person. We're not thinking it's a sit down, let's get everything on paper today. This is an ongoing process, creative, fun, controlled choice, all those words, but it's, they are how we do this at McIntyre. Okay, so and just moving on, I think, I, yeah, I, I, I throw this slide in a person that's going through an end of life care uh, diagnosis, you just consider everyone else around them, consider their housemates and their emotions, because sometimes that goes unmissed, it gets labelled as a, a behaviour of concern, and it isn't, they're part of that person's life, so just think about that as well. And um, Tips, uh, next slide, uh, just around, just type, thinking about uh, what we can do. Give time, talk, listen, provide comfort and give space. There's just some key things to take away there. And if we just move on to, um, if we can get yeah, that one as well. Sorry, I've just, I've gone, I've got, I've got carried away. That's what I've done. Hit, and the changes within a person. I'm a massive advocate of not labeling a person with a new behavior of concern because they're grieving or they're seeing changes or they're finding that process difficult. Really think about what you're seeing and ways you can support them, but not forgetting yourself as well, because this is going to be a, a, a time for you that you could find quite challenging for yourself and your own. Uh, so just be kind to yourself as well. And just a couple of things I'd like to share with you before I leave is our free resources on our McIntyre website are sharing good practice, uh, because we like to share good practice. This is all free for you to download. It's our Wellbeing for Life toolkit. We've been really fancy here and put a QR code on for you to just hopefully it will work, but you can scan and it takes you right to that uh, page and there's a wealth of information there for you. And just lastly, sharing with you, we have a free uh, Dying to Talk Health and Social Care Professionals webinar taking place on Thursday, the 19th of May. Again, it's free to sign up. We're joined by some brilliant consultants. So you won't just be hearing from me. So we're joined by Irina, uh, Beth and Caroline, who are going to bring to life much more for you around Dying to Talk. So hopefully you can, you can sign up to that and that would be brilliant. So I know I've spoken at you a lot. I'm not used to that. I'm used to interaction, but I hope that makes sense. My details are here. Contact me at any point. Uh, my Twitter handles there as our health LD and dementia LD. Uh, so we're re I'm really approachable. So thank you so much for the time this morning. Thank you, Ashling, as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicola. What a rich presentation with lots of really helpful and practical tips for, for people. I really love the health calendar. I think it's got incredible power and I think there's something about how we don't lose those tools that maybe have been developed in the past and kind of, but actually are really, really helpful and do support people with maintaining and um, getting the best health care um, and the one chance to get it right. So um, I'm sure there'll be further questions um, in the Q&A, but thank you, uh, Nicola. So we're now going to move on to our um, next set of speakers, uh, Helen and Anne, uh, Helen Kearns and Anne Corrigan, who join us from Certitude's Treat Me Right team. So Helen is the manager of Treat Me Right. Um, uh, Treat Me Right supports people with lived experience of learning disability and or autism to deliver awareness, training, consultancy and advice on reasonable adjustments to professionals, both internally and externally to the organisation. Starting with health professionals and the local hospital, this then evolved to adding more sites, trusts and types of organisation to the Treat Me Right programme. After training over a thousand frontline medical staff in learning disability and autism awareness, the project was the London Regional Champion in the NHS 70 Parliamentary Awards in the Care and Compassion category. Since then, the project has broadened its scope to include community and advice groups and retail outlets. Um, Helen is joined by Anne Corrigan. Anne is a learning disability and an autism awareness training trainer for the Treat Me Right program. Anne uses her lived experience in training sessions all across London to several professionals to illustrate what people may be experiencing. 
Anne is very passionate about reminding everyone that there is a person behind every label. She says, I love being an awareness trainer. My mum was a nurse and it's like I'm following in her footsteps, but doing a different sort of nursing and making sure the lives of people with learning disabilities and autism are taken into account, making sure people know how to treat us with respect. What a fabulous quote. So I am delighted to now welcome Helen and Anne. Do you want to put your camera on? Oh, there you are, guys. Hello. We can't hear you, Helen. We can't hear you for some reason. Is that better? That's better. I can hear you now, Anne. Well done. So I think you're going to have to speak up, Helen, because you're further yeah. away from the mic. So, we're struggling to hear you. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, we're having a little bit of difficulty. Oh, there we are. So, who are we? Who are my family, supporters, and people with learning disabilities. When we aim to improve the healthcare support and long term goals for people, long term, sorry, we're a little bit in the way here, hang on. Long term outcomes for people with learning disabilities and for autism through empowering individuals and working with professionals. Employ people with lived experience to deliver training and advice. And then we worked with a local hospital, which was Ealing Hospital, and we then expanded into the wider trust. Trained over a thousand frontline medical staff across five trusts and eight London boroughs. Yeah, and that was the piece of work that got us nominated for our parliamentary award, and we were really oh. proud of that, weren't we? So, after that had finished, we wondered what we were going to do next. Can I come up with my idea? Well, we're not, we're, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a different one, but we're going to sure. talk about this next one. Can we have the next slide, please? Oh, so our, when we were doing our work with Ealing Hospital, we were, or we had two main names, we had three main names. So we wanted to empower individuals, didn't we? We wanted Definitely. to work with people in the community. So we did a local health event where yep. we got feedback from people about yep. what their health priorities were and what they needed. And we also got feedback from people that supported them and their families and empowered them. And then, we went into our local hospital and we trained lots and lots of people in learning disability and autism awareness. And we made sure that there was champions on each ward yes. of our local hospital, people who understood about learning disability and, and autism. And, and they wear a purple lanyard, so you know they're different from all the other nurses. Yeah. So once we did all that, we were realising that a lot of people were done all this work with individuals but there was a lot of people that were getting missed for lots and lots of different reasons they're falling through the gap there were still gaps and we wanted to make sure that people weren't falling through them so the missing piece was for us was what what was you know what who could we target to make sure that when the time that people got to hospital you know that they were in a good position to ask for what they needed yes. so this is we had a little we, through the Learning Disability Community of Practice, we heard that there was some funding available for organisations and projects to take on extra projects around promoting the rights of people with learning disabilities and autistic people in healthcare, but also in the community. So we approached them with, a, with a, uh, an idea of how we could reach more people in the community. And this is what we came up with. Next slide, please. What was the missing piece? advice it's, it's advice mm -hmm. care, carers groups patient and advice and liaison service pals which most hospitals have oh, hospitals as well. community groups and specific health support eg health watch yeah so there was lots of places in the community where people were where, where people live that people were going to to ask for help and advice that perhaps I mean, we're making a big assumption didn't have the knowledge about learning disability and autism that Correct. those professionals had or that we had as people mm. with lived experience or people that work directly with individuals so we thought it would be good to approach these people because we 
knew from the training that we'd been given that there were a lot of people living in the community that didn't always know where to go for advice. Exactly. And when they went for advice, those places were slightly unsure about how what the rights of people with learning disabilities and autism and were. And to go about the next step of how to get help for them. Yeah. So, can we, if we have the next slide, please. Have a look at that. We'll, we'll talk about why, why these yeah. groups. Yeah. Hospitals are usually a last resort. Can we help people before there is an emergency? It's an emergency. Yeah, yes, so we can because you try because you need to try to stop it before before people go into hospital to find out what is their problem, if it's an easy problem or big yeah. problem, I mean, how, how they express themselves. Yeah. People usually go to hospital when there's an emergency. Correct. And um and somebody said I'm just gonna check it. Is that any better? Can you hear us? I think we can. I'm not sure if we can back yet. I'm sure some people correct us if they can. Yeah, I, I can hear you. I can hear you quite well. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Help me. Yeah, I'm sure Anne, everybody can hear you. So, yeah, so people are usually, the thing is, is that people in hospital mm, that's are um, there because they're very, very poorly. And, exactly. you know, there's an emergency in their life and their health means that they need to have a lot of medical care all at once so a lot of the time there's a lot going on for people it's a very busy time you know it's not always got time for people to kind of get their head around whether they're what's exactly happening. and not only that sometimes i don't even have time to ring to read the uh what you call it the hospital passports yeah. so and people might not know about hospital exactly. passports until they're in hospital and by that point you know they might have one after a couple of days there when they spent some time but do people in the community know about passports? exactly Okay, so what's the next point there, Anne? Humanities are important in providing support for, to people who might be marginalised. Yeah. E.g. groups where English is not the first language. That is yeah. true. So what we found was there are lots of groups out there that have specialism in a certain area. So what we of, did that work in Hayes. Yeah, so one of the boroughs that we worked in, in Hayes, one of the organisations that we worked with in Hayes, they were specialists in... Uh, language and supporting other people from East African countries and they were trying to get in contact with their local autism specialists who they've yep. been referred to in the community but the autism specialists didn't have stuff in their right. language and, and, they, and they weren't working together all the time exactly yeah so, and and not only that like in the Somalia uh, uh well I mean that country of Africa they have the same word for learning disability and autism which which yeah. they we're going to differentiate. Yeah. So that is why when we went to when we went and Israel came with us to talk to them, I think they sort of understood that yeah. how we were, how we uh, how we uh, how people are different. Correct. Everybody's different. Yeah. So the next point is not everybody with a learning disability and autism has formal or paid support. Some people are supported by their families. I'm still waiting. Yeah. Some people are still waiting. But um, yeah, so and a lot of the time we know that the criteria for being for being el the eligibility criteria for support has changed quite dramatically over the last few years. So there are lots of people out there who maybe have a mild to moderate learning disability or autistic without a learning disability that won't get support from quote unquote professionals, but you know from advice places. So they, for those people who might have a learning disability who live in the community, they'll be able to show a bill that they don't understand to their support worker. But if that person doesn't have support, they would probably would take it to citizens' advice. So exactly. does citizens' advice have the tools that they need to understand that person? Maybe and not. vice versa. Because because unless they know somebody's come through their door who's got a learning disability or autism, they might not know how to deal with them. Yeah. And then of course, advice service, did they know about learning disability? If somebody goes to PALS with a complaint like, nobody looked at my hospital passport, would they be able to help with that? able to know what that was and do, you know well, nobody writes my letters in big print yeah which I'm still trying to <laughs> do, they, <Yeah. laughs> do they know that that's a right of somebody who's in hospital? which is a reason for the adjustment yeah and then the reason the last point is about family carers sometimes don't have access to the same training and resources exactly yeah as those that have full you know we know that people that we employ to support people get a full range of training, but families kind of have to learn by themselves. So we'll learn they through the person who's got the, yeah. learning, the yeah. learning disability like me. And they don't always know what people's rights are or, you know, what tools are available to them under the situation because they might not have any contact services. 
special or social work teams because they might not know that, that person has a learning disability or anything like that or it might be that they were diagnosed in another country and that isn't on any record here so yeah so there's lots of reasons why we target groups so can we have the next slide please labels are for jars not for people <laughs> so how did we get in contact with these people well we painstakingly went borough by borough and found the community directory so we got a list of all the community organizations in each borough and we contacted them by email when we got to speak to community groups we asked them to share with their networks yeah so for every community group that we knew about they were in contact with another 10 community groups and they shared their that's that's how yeah. we spread the word if you know what i mean that's how we spread the word and it was Quite hard to get off the ground at first but once you go one place and talk to them and they exactly. kind of see the value of it they soon tell everybody in their network so you see we must be doing the good work because just because we've got these labels we're still human beings exactly um, and we should be treated like that it doesn't matter like i didn't even know i had a learning disability and autism until i was a lot older i didn't even know i was born with these things i just knew I couldn't fit in for some reason but why i didn't exactly know so for do, doing this job with the Treating the Right project, I've learned a lot from it. So, yeah. And that is why we need to train other organisations. Because everybody who has a learning disability or autism still needs to have a job, but not all companies will take them on for some reason. Yes, yeah. and that's another, not know why. that's another important part of our work, isn't it? Is that yeah. we, we, we people are not, and we train people up. What does that mean? So we wrote the Citizens Advice Bureaus. Oh, that's what's going on. By a snail mail, basically. I've never, I can't remember last time I sent a Snail mail? Yep. Uh -oh. Not email. So, because <laughs> the email, because they were so overburdened that we couldn't get through to anybody by email because they didn't publish their email well, addresses. What about the talking phone? Well, that's what I'm, that's the point I'm getting to. They didn't oh. publish their email addresses because they needed people to call or visit. And the phone number, they didn't publish their office phone numbers either. Oh, great. Because they didn't want people thinking they could call the office and skip the queue on the phone. So after phoning like three or four, we realised that we were never going to be able to get through to the Citizens Advice Bureau. So we wrote to them. Well, we still haven't trained them though. We did. We trained oh, we did. Yeah, we did. So I we trained some of them. Yeah. Uh, we contacted PALS teams via the Learning Disability Nurse Network, mainly because we had the same issue with them. You know, yep. PALS had very fixed phone lines at very fixed times. Yeah. And they weren't always able to answer the phone. So we got in contact with our local learning disability nurse who shared the offer via her network. And we contacted Health Watch and volunteer centres in each borough. And then we contacted carers groups through our organisational contacts who then, tar um, who then got in contact with the ones that um, we know about. So Correct. We were able to share it that way. Okay, slide please. Oh. So, in the time that the project ran, this is what we this is what we achieved. So August 2018 and July 2019, we delivered 95 training sessions to 60 organisations and teams, and 800 and to 802 people. That's it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So for, oh, that that picture was taken at Hillingdon Hospital because I remember that's a nurse. That's a room full of medical professionals. That, that was at Hillingdon Hospital. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but that one I can't really tell. I think that one was at school, but let's uh, move on. So of the 802 people, 36 were from voluntary action groups, 15 oh. were from Health Watch, 72 were from BAME community groups, 27 from Citizens Advice, and 153 were from carer centres and groups and 178 were from PALS teams, and 321 were from general community advice organisations. Genie, Matt. So we, had, we managed quite a large reach, didn't we? Okay. Yes, so it was very good because with the one at Hillingdon Hospital, there was a mixture of every mm -hmm. sort of every department of whatever every they were. Every department and every pay grade and every kind of yes. job from so quarters. It did, yeah. So it didn't matter who they were. They, they still got our training. And we believe that. We believe everybody yep. should get it. It shouldn't just be the frontline people because people upstairs, they still need to know what's going on, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next slide, please. <laughs> oh, so this is just some of the people that we delivered right, to, to just to, people. I know. So I'm not going to go through all of these because I think it's going to take us more time than we have. Just to say that this is some of the people that we managed to get in contact with. So by far our biggest and proudest achievement was the session we delivered at the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Oh, the one up in London. The yes. one up in London, yeah. Um, it was a real honour to be able to go in and tell them a little bit about what we do and also a little bit yep. about how they might better support people who have a learning disability and autistic people. 
did also talk to the Samaritans and Mind. And then we did a lot of work with job centres as well, because a lot of people, oh, yes, of course. a lot of people, we realised very quickly that that was who they had contact with. That was the professional they had contact with. So people were being seen by their job coach, but also talking to the job coach about, you know, things that were going on in their life and all that stuff. And the job coaches weren't equipped for that. So we were able to give a little bit of guidance for that. But you said some women's organisations. Yeah. And kind of the Hackney Community Choir is in there. And that might not seem like you're... Oh, yeah, we're going to church. Yeah, it might not seem like your usual advice organisation, but actually they were a group that people were being socially prescribed to for loneliness in the area. And they got in contact with us and said that we've got a lot of people coming in who, you know, don't fit in anywhere else and we want to make sure that things are good for them. So can you come and give us some awareness training? Oh, so that's why we went. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. I enjoyed it even that word. Yeah. What did attendees value? Well, I think the first you one's can't read it. So it's a chance to speak to people directly about their experience. Definitely. Yeah. We all have a voice. We need to speak. Because, mm -hmm. because everything affects us. All our, all the doctors and, and hospitals we go to, optometrists, they still need to know how we should be treated and whatever else. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that came out as well was that um, a chance to talk the attendees really value a chance to talk to adults with lived experience. Definitely. Especially those people who are parents of young children because nobody had talked to them beyond their child's 18th birthday, you know. When they so, turn into an adult before they move from, from yeah. um, children into adults. Um, adult services and adult support. Yeah, but some people were unsure, you know. Some people were of the belief that their child would grow out of autism because they'd never met an autistic <laughs> adult. You know, some people didn't know that that adults could still have things like Down syndrome. You know, they, they were very keen. There's one that, that group we were talking about in Hayes earlier on, which was the Horn of Africa Youth Association. They just asked us, like, we, we, we have knowledge, we have family members, but we've never met anybody that's a grown up that has these conditions. And we had three sessions with them where they met somebody with Down syndrome. And they gave us nice food to eat. They took. did, yes, <laughs> yes, that was right. Because our first two visits were during Ramadan, weren't they? And then yeah. the third one was an iftar time. We managed to come and eat yeah. with them. Yeah, which was wonderful, actually. Yeah, yeah, I like it. It was good. It was good food. And then they were interested in how sensory differences might impact individuals. They said they would ask good questions in the future. I think that's the thing that's we often concentrate on our training, don't we? Just because so many people don't know about it and it can really make a biggest difference to somebody's experience. Because those people bright lights are really hard to see that. We're struggling to hear you again. I think you maybe have clicked on something and we need to start wrapping it for a uh, wrapping the session up Helen but uh, Anna, but I can't hear you at the moment. How's that? Is that any better? Yeah. Yes, that's better. Okay. And people who ran groups that were used in social prescribing felt they were better equipped to support neurodivergent individuals. And that was really important. The social prescribing was a buzzword. Yeah. A few, you know, it has been, but some of the groups that people were being referred to didn't have the knowledge that perhaps they could have had. So next slide, please. We do need to wrap up. Uh, so what did we learn? This is really important, actually. Uh, we learned that language is powerful. Yeah. Uh, look, many languages, as Anne said earlier, don't have separate terms for learning disability, autism, and other cognitive disabilities. Means that interpreters might not have the knowledge to transfer accurate diagnostic information to families. And that was, that was a real problem, especially yeah. with community groups and carer centres, because their child was given a diagnosis and, you know, they didn't know what it meant. And the centres that were specialists in that area didn't always have the information in that language. The right tools and stuff like that to yeah. tell them how, what it is. Yeah. And because of the way that the unemployment benefits are now structured, job coaches and job centres were finding more people with learning disabilities and or autism on the group. And people that needed a job or needed something to do during the day that didn't have anything to do anymore. And there's a lot more people that they were finding coming into the job centre and they didn't always have, you know, the knowledge or the information that they needed to help that person. Uh, as I said, citizens advice bureaus are very busy. And, you know, if we were going to do this again, I think we would have said that we would make sure that we had a contact in the head office of exactly. citizens advice before we began. And flexibility is important, especially yeah. when there are different kinds of minds and roles involved. And then right. if we can go on to the next slide. Okay. 
So our impact, so attendees said that they felt more confident about supporting those with learning disabilities and or autistic people, and they felt more confident that their organisation could have support this group well. And organisations reported that they would be looking at their sensory environment and being more aware of the impact that it had on individuals. Organisations said that they were now aware that there are many types of autistic people, and that means adults, women and people from cultural backgrounds. I think, we, you know, the, the stereotype for autism is usually a young boy. And I think a lot of people, once they're uh, asked to think beyond that, can get a little bit stuck. But we were really proud that people said, you know, they would be thinking more about that group in the future. So if we go on to the next slide. Because everybody forgets that us girls can get autism as well. Mm -hmm. It's just we, we sort of hide it better than the men you see. So. Sometimes, yeah. Well. <laughs> OK, so shall we? Finish. Yeah, so we've that's our last slide. So thank you very much for listening to us. And yeah, um, and has it been helpful? Oops, that. <laughs> uh, it's okay to ask that, and I think absolutely you want to know if it's been helpful. I have certainly thoroughly enjoyed it, and there's been a number of comments within the the chat. So I know some people had a bit of a challenge, I think, hearing some parts. So we may, we'll make sure you get the the recording. Um, but clearly a very impactful project. So thank you. Thank you so much. So um, you can now turn off your um, your video and go on mute. Thank you. Um, some excellent presentations this morning, folks. Um, I'm very aware that we have three more presentations to, to hear. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to manage um, the, the, the questions. So I'm going to invite um, Nicola and Treat Me Right to look at the questions that have been posted to you in the Q&A and if you could type in a response to that to those particular questions that would be fabulous and I just encourage everyone to have a look at the really helpful answer that Jim has given to Ruth's question uh, around the uh, number of um, designated learning disability and autism nurses to support staff in hospital. We know it's such an important part of helping people to get the right care whenever they are in hospital and supporting the team, the nursing team around someone uh, and the wider clinical team. So, so thank you for that, Jim. Um, uh, before we do move on to our next speaker, um, I do have a question for Lloyd, if you're still there, Lloyd. I mean, we have heard a lot in nearly all the presentations this morning. Can I check that you're still there, Lloyd, and can hear me? No, you've gone. Okay, I missed out on my opportunity. I would have to ask Lloyd another time. But please do um, continue to post your questions and uh, colleagues from the presentation teams will uh, respond to them and, and, and draft a response. So watch, uh, keep an eye out for that. But I certainly want to make sure you get to hear from all of our speakers today. So we're now going to move on to our next speaker. Um, and um, sorry, just getting my, uh, there you are, Michael. Michael Fullerton is Director of Health and Wellbeing with Achieve Together, and is going to talk to us today about relationships. As a learning disability nurse, Michael has worked all of his career to support people with learning disabilities um, and um, has made an enormous difference to people's uh, needs, particularly supporting people to achieve their personal aspirations and access to meaningful employment. As we recover from the pandemic, Michael is enthusiastically committed to seeking out opportunities for autistic people and people with learning disabilities to have a wide range of paid and voluntary opportunities to gain all of the positive and personal benefits that are offered to the person and to society. Michael, you're very welcome. And I pass over to you for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? You sound okay yeah. to me, yes, I can Okay, hear good, you. good, good. And, and, and just in, in terms of that bio, that was for the, the session next week, which, which is focused on employment, but uh, today it's focused on uh, relationships uh, and sexuality. Uh, next slide, please. Um, ju so just to, to continue that introduction. So, um, yeah, so my name is Michael Fullerton. I work with Achieve Together. I am a learning disability nurse. Uh, and I've worked a lot over the years uh, with people with learning disabilities and or autism 
to to focus on um, uh, friendships, relationships, uh, to support people to explore and understand their sexuality, um, sexual safety uh, and sexual rights. And the focus of this session today is to break down barriers so that people with learning disabilities and or autism can have the relationships that they want and also to be able to understand, explore and enjoy their sexuality, uh, which doesn't necessarily require any other relationship than the relationship that we have with, with ourselves uh, and with our own bodies. Um, next slide, please. So um, to, to start, uh, CQC in February last year called for leaders in adult social care to work together to create a culture of openness where people using services feel empowered and supported to be open about sexuality and relationships while ensuring that they are protected from sexual harm. Um, we have this ongoing challenge in adult social care in promoting the freedom and rights of people to express their sexuality uh, while we're navigating the vulnerabilities of people who may be placed at risk from others or who may unintentionally or unknowingly pose a risk to others. And if you're not already aware, please be familiar with the CQC documents re relating to relationships and, and sexuality. You know, really powerful, really useful. Uh, and we want to make sure also that people providing support equally have ac access to these and understand uh, expectations of them. In terms of promoting uh, friendships, relationships and sexual safety, um, for all of us nowadays, uh, social media and the internet are really powerful ways of um, developing and maintaining relationships. So there's lots and lots of positives to, to social media and the internet, but also potential exposures to risk. So being mindful of, of those things also. Uh, next slide, please. And there's also um, nothing more critical to, to all of us than the relationships that, that we hold with ourselves, our families, friends, and uh, where we want it with our sexual partners. And everyone deserves the right to be fulfilled in their relationships. We have a situation in the 21st century where people are not empowered to understand what is possible in terms of the rights. And alongside that, support to understand their own personal responsibilities uh, that go along with that. So empowering people to be more independent and have more control over their life doesn't end with practical day-to-day -day life skills and needing support shouldn't be a barrier to having uh, personal loving relationships. So we now generally have a more positive attitude towards sexuality for people with learning disabilities. However, does this positive attitude translate into helpful supportive experiences for those people? A really important question for us to reflect upon. I'm, I'm gonna pause for a moment for us to reflect on that personally now. Next slide, please. So defining sexuality is not straightforward. Um, we've got a quite a uh, broad definition here from the CQC um, tools. Um, and these include the act of sex um, and the many forms in which the act of sex might, might take place. Sensuality, physical intimacy, sexual orientation, our own body image and personal identity. So sexuality is so different for every single one of us. And, and that's one of the beauties of, of being human. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there are significant challenges I'm going to put it in, in, in terms of challenges for people who use social care. So significant challenges for those people because of the structures and systems within the system. Um, and these are aimed, uh, importantly, at ensuring people are safe, um, but we can be too risk averse. We can have differing views and policies. So we need to make sure the policies are clear uh, and accessible. Um, People live lives in situations where their privacy is impacted because they have perhaps paid support with them a lot of their time. They may have poor awareness of their rights because 
we don't think to explain those rights to the person. Social networks, often more limited. Views might be uh, influenced or, or dampened even by pet supporters or family members with good intent, but can be stifling sometimes. People might fear initiating sexual advances for fear of contact with the police or social services. And society doesn't yet have positive views of the sexuality of people with learning disabilities. Uh, do people still view people with learning disabilities as asexual, not having sexual feelings or hypersexual, oversexualized? And we also have some gendered ideas about sexuality with females being viewed as vulnerable, uh, a vulnerable gender uh, and the need to risk managed predatory male sexual behavior. So, so lots of attitudes to, to think about in terms of our work. Um, next slide, please. Also, um, uh, most recently, we have uh, a new COVID factor. So um, in terms of the social lives of, of people, during lockdown. So it's important that we um, have conversations with people and reflect on the impacts of, of lockdown so that people um, rediscover lost social opportunities. Um, they might need to rediscover confidence and the drive to re-engage with, with, with the social life again and be confident in seeking out opportunities to make friends and potential um, personal relationships. So the COVID factor is really important um, now at the moment. Okay, next slide, please. So um, in terms of the basics, we must, must start from a perspective where there's a need for a healthy organizational culture wherever um, you work um, and ensure that there is a very clear uh, collaborated policy around relationships and sexuality. You know, that in, includes input from people who are supported in social care their families and, and support teams where it's relevant, that this policy is accessible and understandable to all. Um, training around relationships and sexuality is really important, but it's not enough. Um, there must be uh, proactive training, engaging material, um, with ongoing conversations to make sure that we are um, a really open-minded uh, about um, the, the sensitivities uh, and the, the complexities of relationships and sexuality. And being human means we are beautifully diverse and um, we can often, uh, in different stages of our lives, find ourselves in weird and wonderful social situations. And that means that sometimes uh, family members or support teams are, are a, a, in a situation where they need to respond respectfully uh, and rapidly sometimes to unusual social situ situations. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need ongoing dialogue to ensure that responses and guidance that we offer to people are supportive, that people are and feel safe and, and we walk the tightrope well and, and the tightrope of uh, balancing people's rights with the safety of, of themselves and, and other people. Uh, next slide, please. So we've talked a lot over many years around person-centeredness, and this also needs to include an understanding of people's needs and aspirations when it comes to friendships. That, that challenge of the ability to make friends and keep friends, also around aspirations around personal relationships and sexuality, uh, and uh, remembering that age is not a barrier to that. So um, people of older ages, also have needs and desires. Um, we must have very sensitive uh, conversations with people, but um, honest conversations about people's personal identity, their body image, their own esteem, their ability to make and keep friends, um, and, and just making sure that you know, we, we are sort of constantly focusing on people's desires to have relationships uh, and their own personal safety skills. And uh, a really important issue around being mindful of consent and, and the uh, personal responsibility that, that comes with, with this for every individual, um, whether or not you have a learning disability and or autism. Um, and the conflicts uh, that there might be for people in their lives, you know, with family dynamics or perhaps even 
uh, the challenges that somebody has with their own faith in relation to their, their sexuality. So lots of challenges for, for people. So lots of need for, for open and honest dialogue with people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we, we must remember that, uh, the relationship that we hold with, with our own bodies and the importance of understanding ourselves, of exploring, appreciating and, and enjoying our bodies. Uh, for, so for example, example, if you supported someone with a severe or profound learning disability, how often does that person see their, their naked body? Um, does the person even have mirrors in the privacy of their own home at a level that's at their eye level? Uh, it's big enough for them to, to see their own body. So um, it's really important that people have a really um, good sense of self um, and something that is not often talked about or not talked freely about is masturbation or solo sex. And, you know, just well, a great way to have fun on your own and um, to get rid of stress. Also, have an opportunity to check for lumps, bumps, or other changes to your genitals or, or breast. And how boring would it be if you only knew of one single way of pleasuring yourself? Um, so how do people know what's possible in terms of exploration of their own body? And how do people know how to masturbate safely? So leaving that, that thought with you. And um, next slide, please. So masturbation, solo sex, and, and exploration of our own body is really important. Uh, a really important issue is a very complex one, which don't have time to, to deal in detail here, but the complexities of consent um, and uh, making sure that we're, whether it's in person or online, that people are supported, guided. Um, and, and I would put in reference there sometimes with legal monitoring, so sometimes uh, there, there are small numbers of, of people who might have inadvertently or deliberately um, caused risk to other people. Um, and, and there might be some legal monitoring through the courts uh, in order to maintain safety. So being mindful of, of needs there. But the, the issues around capacity and consent are, are really dynamic. So they, they don't stand still. You can't do a capacity assessment with someone and that's it. That's, that's it for the rest of their lives. So the person will need support and continual education. And then really importantly, each of us with capacity has a responsibility to ensure that the other person, um, that our partner has the ability to consent to sexual activity and must consent before and throughout the activity. Um, and I think next slide offers up um, what I find a really um, useful um, short video clip from the Thames Valley Police around the complexities of consent. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Then you can make them a cup of tea, or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea, don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea, they just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind, and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they are unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea, and they can't answer the question, do you want tea, because they're unconscious. OK, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea, and they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle or brew the tea and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe, and this is the important part again, 
don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week, or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. Thank you. Um, next, yeah, brilliant. Um, I'm going to have a cup of tea shortly. Um, so the, the slides here uh, will be available. So um, it might be a, a useful um, a short video clip. It's only about three minutes to, to, to share with people and, and have, have conversations around, around the challenges and complexity of, of consent. Um, and here, just there's a further reading. Um, so uh, within, within the reading here, you've got uh, resources from CTC and Skills for Care. Um, we also have some really, really good information from uh, 39 Essex Chambers around consent capacity, um, particularly around uh, relationships and sexuality. So really good resources there. I'm going to really um, uh, reinforce a signpost to um, Supported Loving Toolkit. So if you're not familiar with this Supported Loving Network, please um, go on to Choice Support Supported Loving Toolkit brilliant resources around all, all sorts of issues around relationships and sexuality, um, really powerful stuff. Um, and then within this as well, um, there, there's three tools here. One is accessing online pornography safely, um, the uh, keeping safe online and transgender support. All of those are um, designed to um, have positive conversations with people with learning disabilities and or autism uh, around um, those themes to keep people safe, but also just to explore people's thoughts and feelings about these issues. So um, please, please access those, those resources. Um, and if I'm right, then that's the very last slide. And I think that was probably it from me. Uh, I haven't paid attention to anything in the chat yet, but I'll do so now. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Michael. I don't think I will ever hear the offer of a cup of tea in quite the same way ever again no, after no. seeing that little video. But very powerful. Um, and your whole talk incredibly powerful and very well. You do have a look at the chat because there is a, there are a number of, of comments within Probably, that yeah. that I think you will find um, uh, helpful. Um, and certainly you can pick up at the end if there are any questions and do encourage people if there are particular questions that you would like to pose to Michael either we can't get to them right in the session we will try and make sure that we get uh, get them answered so thank you, thank you. Um, and I know everybody is very keen to see all the presentations today and we can I can confirm that they will be sent out to uh, to all delegates um, and there'll be links to the the films uh, the, the video within that so you will be able to access all the resources which is so important so Excellent, good stuff. So um, now moving on to our next session, which is very aptly and beautifully entitled The Right to a Good Life uh, from a number of colleagues from Camp Hill Village Trust. So we have Kat Collins, uh, who's co-production lead. After a successful career in theatre and TV, Kat decided to make a big change and move to social care in 2012 and wishes she had done so earlier. Kat is a fierce believer in the value of therapeutic day opportunities for the people we support, as well as more community and employment based support. There is not a one size fits all. We have also, she's joined by Nikki, Nikki Freeman, who's an expert by experience and a resident of Campbell Village Trust. Kat is a Life of Opportunities reviewer 
and became a reviewer because she wanted to help make sure residents like herself were happy with the community they were part of and were getting everything that they want from their local community. Nikki loves performing as an actress, reading books and watching TV. And she tries to remain active by visiting the gym once a week and taking part in Pilates classes on Zoom and in person. And Kat and Nikki are joined by, by Janine Moorcroft, the Director of Operations, who's worked for the Trust since 2018 and previously was in local authorities for many years within housing, health and social care. Janine prides herself in having a person-centred approach and seeing the positive outcomes that can be achieved. She has the privilege of working with people over a very large geographical spread and has been blown away by the resilience of staff and people supported over the past two years. So thank you colleagues from Camp Hill Village Plus Trust, over to you for the right to a good life. Thank you for that. Hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm not sure how I'm going to follow the, um, the presentation from Michael there, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you for that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today um, and to, to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you about the right to um, an independent life. And um, I wanted to, to start really um, with my opening slide, which if you can just move on, please, um, which is which is about our strap line for the for the trust, which is which we title a life of opportunity. And, and and what does this mean to the trust, the staff and to the people we support? And I think it's just important to reflect on this um, and how it does link to a right to an independent life, in particular for what the trust has been through, and what every social care provider has been through over the past couple of years. One of the things that we were keen to do um, was to not lose that vision and, and our strap line through, throughout the pandemic. And we, pre-pandemic, we, we used to have opportunities for people with support across, um, across the, the national spread to come together on a regular basis in, in our regional forums and to share, um, to share their opportunities, to share their learning and thoughts across the trust, which were, which were really powerful to do that in a face-to-face -face environment. And obviously we, we lost the ability to do that. But what we wanted to do is to actually make sure that that continued and through having virtual um, events that were headed up by our co-production team, we managed to, to, to sort of reset and refocus around a life opportunity and we brought people together to, to have conversations about that and, and what that generated quite quickly was, was people's people's own desire to talk about what they wanted their life to look like. Um, and there was a real focus around, around that and it ended up in um, a, a co-produced set of I statements, which essentially had been, had been what everybody was talking about across the trust. Um, there was many things within there, some quite small aspirations and, and some, um, some a lot bigger, but, but actually across those arenas, what we managed to do is to define a set of 10 I statements, which we now hold um, quite closer to us hearts really in terms of what we want to achieve within the trust and that's closely aligned to our strategy to make sure that people have that focus um, and I'm not going to steal the, the thunder of, of Nikki and, and Kat that can that's been much more involved on, on the ground than, than, than myself but I just wanted the opportunity to set the scene really around that um, and you'll shortly hear from, from Nikki, who was one of our life opportunity reviewers. Uh, I'm pleased to say that throughout the pandemic, one of our aims were to make sure that we actually paid um, our experts by experience. Um, so Nikki, Nikki was successful through that recruitment process. Um, we're pleased to have Nikki on board and she's got a really important job now of actually visiting other communities and looking at what we can do to make sure that actually the I statements are achieved. Um, and looking at um, what we can do to make sure that actually our quality and standards are reinforced through, through the important work that, that she does. So that's just a little bit. I'll, I'll not talk too much about that because I'll be stealing too much thunder from, uh, from Kat and Nikki. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Um, and I just wanted to just, just note quickly from a more of a str strategic point of view, really, in terms of our um, vision and mission of the trust, so the, so the three things that I've noted there in terms of people having choice and control um, to live independent lives, um, about how people can access outstanding quality tailored support, 
and um, and having accessible and fair um, care, which is um, quite nicely linked in, in terms of the new social care white paper, people at the heart of care. So I just wanted to, to note that because I think it's important to, to see how we, we will align the work that we do uh, within the trust to that, that important document that I'm sure is on everybody's radar. Um, and without further ado, I, th I think I'm, I'm going to pass over to Kat, who I know um, will be able to, and, and Nikki, who can talk to you much more and share about the I statements um, and that fantastic work that, that's been underway. Thank you. Thanks, Janine. Can I have the next slide, please? So what does a good look life look like? I think um, we can all quite easily fall down a trap of... Um, projecting what we think a good life looks like on the people we support. You know, that it matters to me, so it must matter to everyone. But how often do we take the time to really stop and truly listen to the people we support? So if the pandemic gave us any positives, it gave us time. I mean, life stopped as we knew it, and we really did have lots of time. So throughout lockdown, like many other providers, um, we had a virtual program. They were day opportunities, activities, uh, uh, people connecting, uh, creative writing. And through a series of online Zoom meetings, we had all of the members across the country come together and really discuss what a good life looked like, what really mattered to them, and how could this be reflected and supported in the care that they were given. And from those many discussions, which were very lively, the I statements were created. Can I have the next slide, please? So I want you to look at me as a person, not someone to care for. I want to be in control of creating my life of opportunity. I want to be more confident in the life. I want to grow and develop. I want to be an active part of my community. I want to be involved and connected with others. I have skills and abilities. I may need support to get training, voluntary or paid work. It's all about the time you give to me. I can develop and maintain positive relationships in my ho own home and beyond. I am thriving, not just surviving. And all the people that are important to me work together to help me achieve my goals and live the life I choose. So we'd created these wonderful statements and they came from the people we support. But what was really important as the world opened up and as time was again very short, was that this didn't become some sort of cute piece of work that was forgotten about and destined for a shelf that no one looked at. These statements were not ours to forget or question or change, that we as staff had a responsibility to uphold these statements as we would ensure that the support we were giving truly led to a good life, to a life of opportunity. These statements are now the baseline for everything we do. And I know when you read them, you'll be thinking, well, of course, how obvious, of course we all do that, but it's amazing how sometimes we really can forget. Can I have the next slide, please? So we have threaded through, through all aspects and documents of the support that we are giving. We have aligned them with um, CQC Chloe's. And what you see there is our pathways to progress. This is the, what our sort of our guide for our day opportunity. Opportunities, and they're all embedded online, face to face, to ensure that we to ensure that we can move forward with these statements, and we are being really true to our word. Um, it was important that the work was audited and reviewed often, and by the people who owned it. Um, we therefore employed and trained members of our community to become life of opportunity reviewers. Can I have the next slide, and I'll now hand you over to Nikki. Future of the earth of Camp Hill because I live in the Camp Hill Robbins community. And so, as a reviewer, I have to travel to the different Camp Hill communities and using one of the I statements that we've chosen for that review 
I have to speak to the residents of the community and also the staff and find out how the resident feels, if they're being treated, how they want to be treated with relation to that I statement. And then once we speak to the residents, we also speak to the managers and check that they agree with what the residents said about how they're being treated and they feel supported by their care and the way they're supported and that they can access the day opportunities that they want to access and get the most out of the opportunities that are being offered. Um, so I've taken on this job because I want to like be more involved in my community so I can like gain skills being a reviewer and also I like being paid because it makes me feel like I'm a member of the valued workforce. Okay. Prepare the film? Yeah. Prepare the film. A happy life of opportunity. A life of opportunity. Mm. A life of opportunity. I'm Jeff Jagger. I, I live in Barton and I'm proud of it. To, to my power, my true love and the All the people that are important to me work um, to, together. Mm -hmm. To help me achieve my goals and live the life i chosen. I feel more confident and independent. And I want to be in control of creating my life of opportunity. Ship positive. I like to the ship. I get on very well with my boyfriend, of course, Steve. Uh, he's lovely. I'm Lou, aka Monkey Girl. I am thriving. Not just surviving. And I want to be more independent with my life. I want to be an active part of my community. I have ill and ability. I may need to support and get trained voluntary or paid work. I like to work very hard and earn more money in the garden and the shop. I want you to look at me as a as a person, not someone to care for. Life for what opportunities. It's all about time. Good. Mm. I want you to be in my hands because I need to be others. Want to, my friends, we, we, we ourselves should do it. Ourselves can do it. Thank you for watching my video. I keep everybody safe. <laughs> A life of opportunity is going to be happiness and joy for. Thank you. Live our lives in peace and freedom. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Wonderful. What an absolutely powerful video and powerful presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Kat, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Janine.
Um, we're now going to move on to our final presentation of this morning. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jeremy Tudway, Clinical Director from Dimensions, is going to talk to us about innovations in social care. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Tudway is a Chartered Clinical and Forensic Psychologist and the Clinical Director for Dimensions, leading an integrated clinical team to develop the positive ways we provide support to people. He is a professional psychologist working with people with autism, learning disabilities, and complex mental health difficulties since the early 1990s. Jeremy has been actively involved in training and research, written professional psychology papers for journals, and co-authored a book on integrating psychotherapies. Jeremy, you're very welcome. Are you there, Jeremy? I am here. Ah, I am here. wonderful. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to use that mute word, which uh, we've, we've avoided nope. so far. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Janine, you can turn off and Kat, if you can turn off your uh, videos now um, and we will see Jeremy. Perfect. Thank you. Over to you, Jeremy. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, it's potentially quite a dry subject. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll look at how we can explore how things have changed. Uh, I think that when we think about um, COVID and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, that was probably the biggest challenge the health and care system has faced since it started. And I think that what that did pull up for us was both a series of gaping holes and difficulties, not the least of which were the shortcomings in the provision of health and care and some massive inequalities uh, that, that, that came up from that, um, that has raised, I think, the idea of equality of health care provision, equality of health care access, and has then um, offered us some real challenges for recruitment and retention of staff, particularly as that has now impacted in terms of the cost of living and uh, the amount of money that the government puts into care and support. Um, we had some really clear successes, I think, as well throughout the um, throughout the pandemic. And I think it's it's important to balance those uh, uh, alongside the challenges that presented us with. The most obvious uh, of, of the uh, things that, that, that was a benefit was the rapid progress that was made in digitizing things uh, that allowed us to transform uh, some elements of the service delivery that we were able to offer to people uh, and created very mixed agile working from home and for lots of different people um, providing input and accessing experts. Certainly uh, gone were the days where people would be held up in traffic jams and not able to make it to meetings and certainly it, some levels of clinical input were far more accessible as a result of that. However, that meant that face-to-face -face meetings weren't accessed and weren't uh, facilitated. Next slide, please. So if we have a look at some of the gaps that were that came through as a result of, uh, of that, I mean, it exposed those deep inequalities that we knew between different populations and groups in, in, in the country. Um, if we think about of those people who died, six out of 10 people in the UK who died from COVID-19 were disabled, despite just making up 22% of the population. Um, simply put, disabled people were one of the hardest groups that were hit by the pandemic. That exposed a whole series of issues about lack of funding uh, being made available, about the lack of specialist expertise in certainly in acute health care, um, about what needed to really happen in terms of early screening and some of those difficulties have been exposed um, through the leader work as well uh, in terms of where we can move forward. I think another um, interesting aspect that has come out of it, which is something that we definitely need to be more attentive to, is that people from ethnic minorities were also uh, 
are badly adversely affected by the pandemic and at the risk of um, at the risk of being a job's comforter what that means is as those have been so widely exposed and so publicly that now affords us an opportunity to lead the debate and to push the debate and the discussion uh, about how we overcome those inequalities and how we overcome those inadequacies. Next slide, please. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, I certainly don't need to um, profess too much here is that the the lack of uh, the lack of funding and the neglect of the care sector um, was definitely highlighted right at the very beginning and running through things. And I think that what that has done has exacerbated some of the shortcomings that were already there. So for example, where there wasn't adequate funding, where there wasn't adequate resourcing to provide people with uh, a suitable wage for the very complex support that they offer to people, uh, that has impacted significantly on recruitment and retention across the sector and continues to do so. Um, interestingly, it is moving into an arena where people are far more aware publicly of the need for being uh, supportive of the care sector generally, as it is something that touches lots of people's lives. Again, even though that has been a very negative impact to start with, one of the longer term benefits of that is that it has raised the profile of that issue on the national agenda and means that we can have more meaningful conversations without being sidelined to the back. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at the social care crisis that has emerged as a result of the pandemic and where we can begin to uh, target resources. The first thing is that I think initially there were issues with poor planning, weak policy about how, for example, uh, support would be planned, how support would be rolled out, fragmented responsibilities between health, between local authorities. And uh, yes, I've just noticed a comment there. Yes, I think it does highlight the fact that there was very poor public understanding of what it is that we, we do in the care and support sectors. The Brexit dividend, where we lost large uh, um, amounts of our workforce as well, combined with low wages and the public perception and value of the work that we do in the care and support sector has also amplified and come together in something of a perfect storm. And now we have this crisis that we need to think very carefully about how we plan work in the future. And it has yet again, as I say, raised the opportunity to push for more resourcing and to enable this to become a political issue that is no longer something that is just pushed to the, to, uh, to the back seat, that is no longer in the um, in, in the minds of our political leaders. I think one of the other things that was uh, a very significant is um, that many people with learning disabilities and or autism were left without adequate care or support that they were reliant upon or that they could rightly expect as citizens by the impact of the pandemic. That forced us into a position, and I, I note that, that, that colleagues from the Camp Hill Trust's way of utilising that opportunity was to begin to think about what it is that we can offer to people, how we can work better with people, and what things we can do to contribute to supporting people to have the best lives that they can have. That, I think, is is a dividend that came out of it, but came out under very sad circumstances. There are still lots of people with learning disabilities and autism where things that were part of their everyday level of support, they're still not getting that and those facilities aren't available or are still operating in a, a relatively locked down position. So again, I think it's the fact that this provides lots of hard evidence even if we actually needed that, but I think we did, 
to begin to force politicians and to force the national debate in terms of where the media moves forward so that it becomes part of everybody's agenda to be attentive to the need and for the uh, for the crying need for investment and reform in the way that we offer support and care to people next slide please so let's start to think about some positive developments because that's all been a bit negative really um i think one of the things that i remain very humbled by was the commitment and care of colleagues and staff throughout the pandemic um, they continued to work they worked additional hours and shifts um, they continued to find unique and interesting innovative ways of working and supporting uh, people and i don't think we should underestimate first of all the stress that, that placed on our colleagues but also the longer term impact on the well-being of those colleagues who carried on regardless um, there have been uh, quite a lot of media highlights on the impact that the co uh, that covid demands had among um, colleagues in the nhs and particularly frontline nhs staff and i think at times that missed out on very similar effects for people in the support and care sector and i think that that is something that perhaps we as a group of colleagues working in that sector need to push further and and, and force the media to spend more attention and highlight um, the 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 other thing that has come about i suppose is the loss of lives that went on uh, thank you the, the loss of lives that went on uh, for um, people who were supporting during the pandemic it disproportionately affected people with from ethnic minority backgrounds and more than 900 health and social care staff lost their lives throughout that as of February 2021 so that number is going to be significantly higher that has been recognized by politicians and I think that it's something that yet again we need to perhaps find a way of uh, remembering and maybe create something as a national remembrance day for those staff because they were very committed the compassion that came through was quite remarkable and i think that one of the things from that we can do is move towards that that genuine recognition next slide please so where do we go from here what we need to do really is to put the workforce at center stage and have a look at how we invest in our workforces how we look at developing our colleagues and where we focus on well-being we need an absolute step change on inequalities and population health um, uh, sorry i'm just noticing the comments at the bottom yes um, we need lasting reform for social care. I think the, 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 the Care Act was introduced fairly rapidly. It didn't necessarily link into some of the other elements that, that need to go on in changing how care and support works. So we need something that is really a root and branch reform. We need to embed more acceleration of the digital change so that people can access the widest possible range of opportunities in the most dynamic and effective way possible learning the positive lessons from the pandemic and how that impacted on us being agile but making that agility available for everybody we need to think more carefully as well about the relationship that different communities uh, have with public services and I think I'll, I'll move through quite quickly now to the King's Fund uh, priorities. So that's the next slide, please. Um, we need to deal with our recruitment and our staff development. We need to uh, have a look at the routine care gap needs and how we can um, how we can improve that and re redress the delayed gaps in, in terms of doing that we need to develop the integrated partnerships in support but also focus on building resilience as a positive development for workforces um, 
if we can have the next slide, please. Part of that is to move into the integrated care systems. Now, those are starting to develop at the moment. What we need in terms of those to work is that we need to have more attractive salaries and pay, develop more opportunities for proper flexible working, yet again, focus right down onto the support for staff well-being. So we look at how we can retain staff, how we can in enable staff to have time off following intense periods or stressful times, have access to psychological support that it is a key part of our recruitment and retention strategy, and how we develop a, a culture of compassion and collaboration. That's where inclusion comes from, and that's about working with other people. Uh, and then if we can have the next slide, please. So the, the integrated care systems in theory will provide us with an improved support and care, high quality workforces and high, high quality places for staff. And then it has the potential to bring more balance into things and effectively become a far more provider collaborative model to maximize things. And then just finally, uh, there's a couple more slides. So if we can go to the next slide, um, there are some key points on there as we need to uh, move things forward in terms of making those changes. The next slide, please. Sorry, I know I'm rushing now, but I'm aware that the, the time has been a bit pushed. That in terms of the provider partnerships, which I think is a really useful innovation in terms of the, um, the provider collaboration within the integrated care systems, we have the opportunity to work in partnership with other providers and not necessarily see them as competitors, which is a far healthier and I think a far more psychologically positive way to go forward. Um, we have the all party parliamentary groups that we can input to in quite a systematic way. We can then move the NHS to make good on its promises about healthcare inequalities. We can also move the NHS to bring into bear some of the um, steps and identified uh, targets from the Autism Act and then embed that idea of partnership moving forward through a range of uh, opportunities. And then um, just finally, if we move to my last slide, something about the, the, the lighter slide, the lighter side of things. Uh, I don't know if people remember, but one of the, the amusing things about the challenges of working remotely was the um, the wonderful Zoom filter mishap. And I shall put it on to try and play. Can you play it for me? Oh. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh. take Take we're trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. I, I had can, to. I can see that. Um, I think if you click the up arrow next to the um, yes, <laughs> sorry about that. I just wanted to end on that because I thought it was um, it was one of the slightly amusing things about the challenges. But I do apologise for having to rush. But I'm aware that time was pushed. Jeremy, thank you so much. And I'm, I know I was partly pushing you to uh, to wrap <laughs> up because we are. Uh, I'm I'm very mindful that we promised people we'd finish at one. But so much rich information in your in your presentation, and we will be, as we said, making sure everybody gets access to the full presentations. Um, I also really encourage you all folks to um, have a look at the King's Fund uh, report that Jeremy uh, references in his uh, in his slides. So 
We're going to bring our session uh, to an end now. Um, it's been wonderful to see all the contributions in chat. And I know we're going to keep the sort of site open for a little bit longer. So if there are questions that we can answer, we will do so through the Q&A um, and, and we will continue to, to, to review and respond to, to the chat. So I suppose I really want to end by saying, I mean, clearly, COVID-19 and particularly Jeremy's later, the last presentation, really demonstrates how much the challenges of getting good health and good life support have been exacerbated and you know, further identified those enormous health inequalities. And, you know, uh, I am concerned about how we make sure people are getting the right care and support. Um, as we, you know, in the post-pandemic world with the increasing stretch, particularly on the NHS. Um, so that's why sessions like today are so important because we heard really powerful, practical and innovative examples that go a long way to helping people to get a good life. And, and a good life is about health, but it's also about death. It's about sex. It's about rights. It's about community development. It's about a life of opportunity. And what's really you know, my last kind of thought that I want to leave you with is that people with lived experience are where the expertise sits. And you know, it's been so powerful in the examples that have been presented to us today, where people who are experts in their own lives and can bring that expertise to make sure others are getting better support. That's the that's as well as the power balance that we need to all be working to shift, as Jim uh, said in his opening presentation. Um, I'm going to um, uh, thank you now and thank everyone who has helped behind the scenes as well in, in making this morning session such a success. I think we've all learned something. I hope you remembered my challenge at the beginning that you're going to take something, one action, something that you are going to do differently to move us forward in addressing the inequalities that people face. It is now 13.06. Uh, I am sorry we've overran slightly, but I am sure you understand and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you to all our fabulous speakers. You are all fabulous. Thank you. Take care. Bye. I think a number of our presenters are still on the call and I just wanted to take the opportunity to say a really big thank you to you all. You really were, you really did do, do well, full of rich, rich information and 
you know, very powerful um, messages, I think. So um, I just wanted to, uh, I'm about to leave uh, now. So I just, before I did, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say a really big thank you to you all. Um, and thanks, of course, to the team at Care Talk who you've done a great job, really well put together. Um, so take care. Bye. Special bye to, to Anne. See you soon. Bye.